Welcome, everybody. I'm Chris Carberry, CEO of Explore Mars. And before we bring on our panelists, Amy and Nami, a few announcements first. First of all, for those of you who don't know what Explore Mars is, I know we have a lot of new people coming on to watch our wonderful webinar today. Explore Mars is a nonprofit essentially with the goal of achieving the Star Trek future. But we're going to be starting off with humans to Mars sometime in the 2030s. And this is our goal to achieve this. We build communities and partnerships in the air with aerospace professionals, scientists, policymakers, STEM educations, obviously the entertainment industry, um, innovators, and people all around the globe. Just whoever wants to be involved in this wonderful goal of getting humans to Mars and elsewhere in the solar system and hopefully in the universe one day like that Star Trek future, that is what we do. And our bi biz biggest event of the year is coming up next year. It's the Humans to Mars Summit which is on May 16th through 18th, 2023, taking place at the National Academy of Sciences building in Washington, DC. If you haven't been there, you should and come to our conference. It is a beautiful building. It's worth the admission just to see the building, <laughs> but the conference <laughs> is for as well. So I hope you'll all come to us. As you know as well, we're reaching the end of the year. So we hope you will consider making a generous donation to Explore Mars. We have an extraordinary lineup of programs next year. Now that we are getting back to some semblance of normal, we're doing in-person events, not counting, this one's not counted in that, of course, <laughs> but you know, would love your support to help fund that. And I haven't told any of my team members yet, we're also gonna do a um, intro to Explore Mars webinar in January. Uh, so Amy, just so you know, and Wade, who's on you know, managing the technology, surprise. So please, I hope you'll join us for that and make a generous donation. So without further ado, I wanna first off, welcome Amy Imhoff, who just joined our team as Director of Outreach and Strategic Partnerships. When she's not with Explore Mars, she's managing the affairs of Kate Mulgrew, Captain Janeway of Voyager. So she has, she already has this wonderful connection with the Trek community and the science fiction community. So without further ado, Amy, why don't you start our wonderful um, discussion today with Nami. Great. Thank you so much, Chris. And thank you for the warm welcome to Explore Mars. I am so excited to be part of the team and excited to be here with you guys today to talk to Nami Melamad, a fantastic composer. She has over 100 IMDb credits to her name. Uh, she's done not one but two Star Trek series, and she is the first woman to score Star Trek and only the second woman to score a Marvel movie. So welcome, Nami, and I'm so excited for our chat today. Thank you. Me too. Um, thank you for having me. And, you know, what 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 you guys are doing is is, as Chris said, the real, you know, the real deal. You are advancing the star, the, you know, that promising future that that Star Trek shows. So, you know, you seek out new life and new civilizations and <laughs> no, literally no one has gone before. So. I know, nobody. Yeah, we're, we're trying to get boots on Mars. I think that's going to be so exciting. And, and that was one of the reasons why I wanted to be part of this organization, um, yeah. you know, work, working with the Star Trek community and working with Kate. Um, I just meet so many incredible scientists, um, women in STEM, uh, just people who are advancing the Roddenberry future. So I'm excited that we're going to be having our, I'll be at my first Humans to Mars Summit in May. Wow. And, but first we're going to talk all about what you've been doing in space. So, so you're scoring <laughs> space. You're scoring space. Yeah, I'm, I'm, and I think we're definitely going to kick it off and then welcome, uh, welcome to all of my Trekkies who have joined us. Thank you so much for joining us at uh, on a Wednesday and on this I'm in I'm in Connecticut so you know this uh this gray day it's a, a nice way to uh to have a nice connection with um with our love of Star Trek and I realized that Nami has scored my very favorite short trek which is Q&A and apparently this was your first foray into the Star Trek universe so do you want to talk a little bit about how you got that job um <laughs> what, it was like, what it was like scoring that and I know it has a great musical moment with Spock and uh, number one so let's let's chat a little about that and we'll, we'll use yeah. that as our, our diving board sure so this was like um very early on um I think it was 2019 if I'm not mistaken and um 
I I didn't I didn't see that coming at all. So and I'm glad I didn't because I would freak out completely. Um, but it was kind of like you know my agent told me the day before kind of thing that you know I'm going to that I'm going to score this. <laughs> and I'm like what? That's amazing. Um, so I you know I went I went to the secret hideout and met with Alex Kurtzman, all these like you know all the producers. Um, and it was you know we we watched it together and we spotted the film like we uh, we decided where where music should go and what what kind of music will go in those cues and and how you know what point of view we're trying to make um and yeah and then i realized it was it was Fox, it was Fox's first day on the enterprise and you know I, I totally connected with that because it was also my first day on the enterprise so <laughs> yeah, I, love that, I love that you have that connection with with yeah. the show like in, in our star trek family we always like to say <laughs> what was your entry point into Star Trek? What was the first thing you did? And this was it, the oh, first, yeah, the first, uh, the first day. day. Yeah, for sure. And I shared it with Spock. So <laughs> that's amazing. What, what better than that, it could be. Um, so, so yeah. So I, 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 you know, I was hoping to capture all the emotions that Spock's is definitely trying to not show. <laughs> uh, yeah. But you can't help with feeling that awe at the end because you know you're on the bridge and it's just gorgeous and and Pike is there. Like it's it's just so. Um, mesmerizing. So I, I felt the same throughout, like when we recorded the orchestra, all, all of, you know, all of the process, the, the final mix, like to me, that was like, wow, I, I want to do this every day, all day. <laughs> like, and I, I got very lucky to, to actually continue to do that. <laughs> um, because after that, I, I started working on, on Star Trek Prodigy, which then led to Strange New Worlds. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just really glad that the, these shows are, are happening <laughs> and that Star Trek is, is back, you know, like in, you know, since Discovery and like all the, you know, um, Lord Dex, like and Picard, like all, all of these shows are, I, I, I you know, we are, we're religion. living in the second golden age of Star Trek. Yeah, I, I, I watch them religiously every every Wednesday night at midnight. So. <laughs> yeah. so did you grow up as a Star Trek fan? Like, were you a sci-fi fan I, in general? I was a sci-fi fan. I, I wouldn't say I was a Star Trek fan because I didn't understand a lot of it at the time. Um, you know, when when I grew up, uh, this was like the, you know, so the nineties. Uh, <laughs> I'm older than I look. Um, so. Um, I, I didn't, you know, it was everything was in English. I didn't really understand the cost. I, you know, I saw the costumes, I saw the pointy ears, but I didn't really fully yeah. uh, understand what our, our uh, audience might not know that uh, you are Israeli and Dutch. Oh, oh yeah, right. Sorry, I, I grew up in Israel, so yeah. um, you know, English was was not my strongest suit, at, you know, until I read Harry Potter and that, that, that's <laughs> what I in English. Um, but yeah, so. Um, I actually came to sci-fi in general through through music because I started developing this this really big interest in in film scores. Um, really, like I was probably twelve or, or thirteen. Like it was very very early, and there there were all these movies around and all these amazing scores, like you know Howard Shore, uh, Howard Shore's Lord, Lord of the Rings, and uh, Hans Zimmer's uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, and I think he did it with with Klaus Bedell. Um and all, all these like you know incredible scores there was a score uh by Fons Marquis he's a Dutch composer um and uh it was a it was a film called The Tveling the, the tw Twin Sisters um and it's it's such a great great film and so all these you know melodies stayed with me and I would play them on piano and I you know I'd try to see how you know how I can how I can do that and then you know, once once you strip out all the amazing orchestrations and the big, you know, instrumentation, you end up getting a melody and a harmony. And you know, the themes are all and the motifs are always like they were very very melodical. You could play them. And once I realized I could play them, <laughs> I was like, okay, I could probably write them too. <laughs> um, so so that's you know, and that's how I encountered all these like amazing scores, like the Star Star Wars scores for by John Williams, and then the Jared Goldsmith theme for the, the motion picture. <laughs> that was to yeah. me like, whoa. And I had to I had to understand how he did that. <laughs> and I actually to this day I have I have his um his full score <laughs> here. It's actually yeah it's on the piano because I, I look at it. Like, how did he do that? What what did he like <laughs> you know 
Um, so a lot, a lot of, a lot, you know, I, I constantly think that what I do is, is constantly study. Like, you know, mm -hmm. I, I'm constantly amazed, even score a score that I heard many, many times after, like, you know, I still, I, I listen to it again and I'll be like, how, you know, this is amazing. I, I haven't heard that, that one yet. So, uh, so yeah, I, I really got, you know, I, I got very familiar with, with like all of the track music, like M Michael stuff, uh, from 2009 and, and further and the Alexander crush stuff like it, you know, and then watching, watching the shows, uh, you know, Dennis McCarthy, like all of his work on, on Voyager is just outstanding. Yeah. Like Space Nine is actually my favorite theme. So I, I love the Deep Space Nine. Theme. I love Voyagers too, obviously, but it, it's, it's, uh... <laughs> The Deep Space Nine theme has that quality, like it's haunting at first, and then you know you you, you go into this this the right. space station and the you know, and then they added a little life to it later on after a couple seasons, which is you know it seems like more of a busy hub rather than the lonely outpost. And I love that the music can communicate that. Yeah, that that was a good change. <laughs> yeah, uh, but yeah, it's again like I think it's my my second favorite show after after Voyager. <laughs> Voyager is your favorite. I mean, I love Voyager, and I think there was a moment I read an interview where the cast. They played the song for the cast for the first time, and they said how moved they were um, at the, the majesty of it. And, and, and you know, so what is your uh, educational background in, in music theory? Like, well, how did you, you know, some of our viewers uh, might, you know, want to be film composers, or they might, they might just be super curious as to how that trajectory right. happens in your career, and, you know, through education and through your experiences. Right. So first of all, I'm going to say that there are so many ways to get to where we want to be. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure that the Mars Explorer, the Explorer Mars definitely understands that. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, some people go through like, you know, assisting other composers and then kind of getting work through them. And I, I actually went in, in a more independent route. Uh, I felt like, uh, you know, I, it, it, it would, would help me um, kind of like work in different genres um, and, you know, not, not just uh, focus on, on a certain style of writing. Um, so I, you know, I, I went to school in Jerusalem Academy of Music because I'm, I'm from Israel and uh, they had like a, a class that was um, like a course that was um, for uh, interdisciplinary music. So it wasn't just like, you know, how to write contemporary scores um, or, or concert music. Uh, it was also you know, about Arab music and Indian music and all these like other, you know, jazz arrangements and how do you work with a big band and how do you write for a, a symphonic orchestra? Um, so learning all of these things really helped out because when, you know, when when I needed to write a score for Subira, which is a, a film from Kenya, <laughs> um, I could, you know, use all these these tools that I, I learned of, of like how, how to create that sound, how to, how to create a, a feeling of, of like African, you know, music. Um, and, and so it, you know, I, I feel that that kind of education was very helpful. Um, and then the other thing was a lot of like uh, hands-on experience. So I wrote like, I wrote music for student films and for animations. And even if it was, you know, really short things like 30 seconds, but to me it was, it was, you know, kind of like a canvas I could paint on, you know, and I, I could try all the colors and I could, you know, and I could make some mistakes too. And, and, um, and slowly I started getting more work, like like documentaries and theater and um, and bigger films and then feature films ultimately and uh, a couple of TV shows back home. And uh, and then I moved here um, to study at the University of Southern California. Um, so they have a, a scoring program um, called uh, the, the I mean, at my time it was SMP TV. Now I think it's a different name, but uh, it's a graduate school for, for one year where they kind of get you through a lot in that one here. Um, basically you record music almost every week um, and you can, you know, you have the opportunity to work closely with cinema students. Um, so you can, you know, work or work on their films and you can you can use the facilities of the cinema school to actually record an orchestra if, if you have the budget. So and you know I, I I would go to like fellow students like you know friends who who played uh you know violin and and, uh, and cello like you know a harp player like and I was like will, will you come play for you know and and it was fun it was basically a great experience for everyone because everyone you know enjoyed the being in the room making music um getting some credit getting getting some money like it, it was you know it was a really good thing so um that's kind of how it all started um and then you know continued the same route of like 
work, 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 and, you know, write in all. Hard all work, work, hard work and practice. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's how I, yeah, things worked out <laughs> sometimes. Yeah, they really did. Um, and, and, you know, moving from a short, a short, like uh, Q and A into Prodigy, which of course, you know, you have the sustained yeah. story and, and Prodigy is so beautiful. All of the, the, the colors and the, the animation style is, it seems very unique to me. Um, so uh, we have a question from somebody in our audience. So oh, Lori okay. wanted to know, uh, if, what are the flavors and colors of the show? You know, how she, she loves the, she loves the, the music on Prodigy, she says. And she said, you know, when you, when you sit down and you, you start to score a scene from Prodigy, um, you know, do you start with the emotion? Do you start with the action? You know, what's the, what's the inspiration for you to be kind of begin uh -huh. that scene? Like what's your entry point into that scene? Oh, that's a really great question. Um, so with, that's a really good question. Uh, with with Prodigy, um, so what what we did at the, the very beginning um, was to come up with uh, with themes for for each character and motifs, um, and this was really important groundwork because you know I, I've established what Zero's theme is going to be. I've established what what Dal's captain theme is going to be, yep. um, and I've, I've established what you know our mission. Um, mission theme is going to be, and what Janeway, Captain Janeway's theme is going to be, and when we meet uh, Vice Admiral Janeway, uh, then you know her theme already appears in in episode ten um, at the yep. very very end, and you know, and then it comes back in episode eleven, like, um, and it will come back throughout the season, uh, the rest of the season. So um, you know, doing all this groundwork and kind of establishing what what color, what melodic lines will, will be, uh, which instrument is going to be for for each of the characters really help, helps you kind of um, have a plan or a structure, you know, even when you start a new episode. So when I know that Zero has um, has the, this um, piccolo that that is, you know, kind of a natural instrument to me, like it's, you know, it doesn't have to be super high in the register. Uh, I'm, I'm a flute player, so I, I love yes. it. Yeah, I, saw, I think that's in your profile. You're a flute, clarinet. I mean, I'm sure you play yeah. so many so things. I, I use a lot of, of, of woodwinds and I, f I feel that's really good color, um, you know, for, for everything. And, and Jankum has this like more, more of a jazzy clumsy vibe. So, and yeah. that like, trombones with a pizzicato basis. Um, so, you know, you, you try to find the characteristic that would go with each character and, and would define it. And whether it's like, you know, a certain instrument or a certain um, harmonic or color choice or, uh, or, you know, something that will define them. And then when I start writing a new episode, um, I, I would, you know, usually come up with some sort of a sketch. Like a lot of times it'll be like, you know, just, just watching it and playing along to it. Uh, sometimes I'll choose to play along with like strings and horn. Um, sometimes I'll, I'll choose to play along with, with just, you know, strings and kind of feel, you know, what, my, what my tempo is going to be for this, what my beat is going to sound like, uh, how, how quick does it need to feel? And I, f I feel like that that is like one really important thing um, <clears throat> when you come to score anything because um, your, you know, your reaction to the picture and to what is happening in the story um, will determine what the score is going to feel like. Cause, cause my reaction needs to, it, it you know, the audience reaction needs to, um, it, sorry, it, it will be impacted by my music. So I need yeah, to for sure that I get the right emotion so that the audience will also get the right emotion or the, the emotion that the filmmakers wanted to show. Um, so obviously we, 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 we have spotting sessions and we discuss what we're going to do. Um, but ultimately, yes, everything is derived and influenced by, by the action of the characters and, you know, all these moments that you have to sort of what we call hit. So, uh, moments where where there is a big change in the scene, or moments that um, you know uh, that that it's a, a joke, and we need to like somehow mm -hmm. mark that joke. Uh, whether it's to to build some some big you know climax to that joke, and then it's like come out on that joke, and it's it's just funny and awkward, <laughs> or or maybe you know maybe we're building towards some an explosion, or you know there's all all, all sorts of you know and. Oh, nuances. I, I call that nuance. Um, so that's, you know, to me, the challenge is to find those those right 
points at those right moments and and the tempo that would lead to that so that's how it um I, I noticed um I know I noticed when I so I I rewatched you know for our audience I, I rewatched um the children of the comet of the strange new world episode last night and I also rewatched memento mori which is the gorn episode oh yeah and, you know when you talk about you know speeding up and and writing the music for somebody like something like the gorn which you know it's a, it's like a horror moment right you know you get the yeah. The, it zooms in on Pike and the music starts to amp up and you're just like, yeah. this is, this is <laughs> I loved that. I love that. And then, yeah. so when you're reading for horror, like, um, <laughs> and I've, you know, watching and reading about, you know, video game scoring recently and, you know, just in prep for this, for this um, webinar, I wanted to kind of get your, your thoughts on, you know, scoring horror versus scoring the more like family friendly prodigy <laughs> versus scoring like the, the, like you said, the, the children of the comet, we'll talk a little bit about that more in depth because I know that was a, an episode really based on music, right. but you know, I, I'd love to hear the, the difference between, you know, the, the horror elements of the Gorn versus, you know, some of the stuff we've dealt with in prodigy, which can't be too scary. You know, I, sometimes you think like, it can't be that scary. It's for kids. Like they're not going to, Murph's not going to die. It's just for kids. <laughs> Actually, my first draft of Prodigy of, of the first episode, because Taurus Lamora is kind of a Taurus uh, Lamora. Oh, oh, let's let's let this show it, kids, and let's start it out on a slave planet, a safe yeah. slave world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so so that was you know, that was a big a big thing. Um, you know, and we did discuss that that it need it doesn't need to be as dark. I mean, it needs to be dark, but there has to be hope. Um, and every time that we can show a little bit of that hope and and kind of um, have that little promise of, of you know, of Dal's um, actions and, 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 and Zero and like all these little moments of, of like, yeah, maybe they're going to make it out of there. Um, then, you know, it was it was my my task to, to kind of lighten up that mood a little bit uh and and make sure that it, it still feels like an adventure and that we're going somewhere and it's not just dark yeah. um and yeah the with the gorn it's <laughs> it's completely the opposite thing because because you want to up the stakes as much as possible with your music and <clears throat> a lot of times with horror um what you'll do is actually stay out of the way, but in a way that is, you know, keep a very like, um, you know, eerie, eerie tone. Um, and it could be very light. It could be just just a, a tiny little string playing, you know, and it's just you can cut the tension throughout. Like it's so it's so scary. Um, I love that. I love that use of that, too. Yeah, exactly. And and so, you know, I, I love doing those things where, where you just hold attention and then, you know, you play a little something in the bases or you play something in the low end. And um, just another trick that I really love is, is like, you know, when you're using something super high and super low, it just creates that sort of really, really scary dissonant like you know just just it doesn't even matter what the notes are like it's it's the feel of it and that's that's also a lot of my approach to to scoring strange new worlds is like i'm i'm going for um for for mood um you know i'm, mm -hmm. I'm going yes there's like all the themes there's motifs there's there's things you know melodic stuff going on i'm i'm again i'm a flute player <laughs> i grew up playing <laughs> in the orchestra and flute only plays one note at a time. So it's, you know, it's yep. usually me melodic. Um, but, it, but, but just understanding the idea of, of like color to me is, is, mm -hmm. it, is really important with, with a show like this. Um, Cause we're definitely going for, for mood. So, so to me, the Gorn are, <laughs> uh, are, are that kind of thing where, where it's, it's mainly stress. It's mainly like, tension it's it's not necessarily the horror of like Hitchcock you know dang, dang, dang. it's not that yeah, it's, yeah. Um, so so actually go, going the less um you know even, and even on those scary moments like it it, it will not be like that it, it will always be like m more on the tension side um yeah I love I love hearing you know how excited you are about, about <laughs> that balance and and making it so interesting and pulling in the viewer, you know, like, yeah. like uh, the conversation that you're kind of having. And we have a really good question from uh, Kira in the audience saying, going along with the motif of writing what you know, and having never actually been to space, <laughs> what do you personally consider to be 
an incisive moment in your experience to help you compose these scenes? Like what, what are you drawing from when you, when you, when you're, are you drawing from like, you know, your love of, of classic cinema? Are you drawing from, you know, us, your, your idea of what sci, what sci-fi sounds like to you? You know, yeah. how are you, how are you uh, approaching that? <laughs> well, first and foremost, story and character. Um, like to me, y- you know, yes, we're dealing with a space scenario. Like, yeah, the, the our, our heroes are in space, the crew, you know, regardless of, you know, Prodigy or Stranger Worlds, but, you know, um, but I think what Star Trek is all, you know, what the show is, you know, in general about is that we we explore strange new worlds, we explore these like new civilizations, but we also reflect on ourselves with that. Yeah, <laughs> so- you have a really deep Pike moment, you know, where he's struggling. That was part of the Children of the Comet episode yeah. that I watched, where he's struggling with, you know, his fate that he has seen. Yeah you know, having these conversations, they like bookend the episode with, you know, he and Una in the quarters talking about, right. you know, this tragedy. And, and I'm, I'm interested to hear, you know, how you approach those quiet, those quiet Pike moments, you know, right. those, <laughs> and not just in like, and even um, Uhura in, in that same episode is, is wondering about her place in Star Trek, right. in, in a Starfleet and wondering where, you know, if she's in, in the right pr- profession, she says, I don't know what I'm doing. This is only my first away mission. Oh my God. Yes, I totally feel that because, <laughs> well, again, so this reflects on human emotions and I, you know, we all have them. We all share yeah. them and we all have this, like, you know, we can totally identify with, you know, basically, you know, Pike's destiny is, is everyone's destiny. We all, you know, we're all not going to be here at some point. So, you know, it, it's finite, like, you know, you're, and, 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 and same with, with the Hura, like we, we all start out in a new place. We're not sure if we want to stay, like it's, yeah. you know, so, so finding these emotions are, is something that, you know, we can all connect with. So when I'm, when I'm writing a piece for, for the story, it needs to be something that is, refl- it, it's from these characters. Um, so yeah, it helps with, they have, you know, <laughs> their own themes, their own, um, you know, mm-hmm. and you can, you can, you know, take a certain theme that appears, let's say in episode one, where, where Pike rides a horse. <laughs> um, and it's, a, you know, that's a very epic and variation, an epic variation of his, his theme. And then by the end of that episode, it comes back in like a, a, a way more somber and like, you know, the enterprise yeah. is my home is where he says, um, and same for the end of, uh, of children of the comet. So, um, you know, it's, it's part of, part of the composer's job is, is to be able to weave those themes in, in a way that will feel cohesive to the story and also really true to the moment. Like as long as you're staying true to, to the moment and to the characters and where the story is going and never forgetting that the story is what drives you forward, then you're yeah. going to be fine. And yeah, obviously there's like a lot of influences from the original series um, because everything that you, we- Did you watch a lot of that or did you want to oh, keep yeah. it? Did watched, you wanna... That was the first Star Trek show I watched. Like I watched the entire original series, um, I and, and then TNG and then uh, Voyager Day Night. Like that was my order was almost as the order of the um, you know of the actual franchise. But um, uh, so so yeah, it's very heavily. I mean, the entire show is is heavily influenced by by um, um, the original series. So you know, you see the costumes, you see the acting, you know, the characters. <laughs> um, but also the sounds, like all, all of it. So so the music also had to kind of communicate with it. So what we're trying to do is is to, to take all these elements from the original and you know make it work for 2022. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's how I perceive my job. Like I mean, we're we're basically a direct pickup from you know an episode that aired. <laughs> well, well <laughs> in, in ninety, like it, it's a. So what we're trying to do is 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 to, to be faithful to that, like you know, and, and to capture that essence of, of promise of of like you know, and yes, not all episodes are ending with a happy ending, like, but but it's- I, I I like that about new Star Trek. I think that you know they they always and I and of course I'm I'm a huge fan of all legacy Trek, and I love that they they can wrap up their stories in an hour. But I also love the the continuity. I mean, Deep Space Nine was one of the first shows to do serialized yeah. storytelling on TV. Yeah. And it was in a time that, you know, when not a lot of TV was doing that. And I think it's great that we're, we're carrying yeah. that thread through. It's, yes, it's a callback, but it's also modernized. Exactly, exactly. So episodic, what was a big arc. And I really love, you know, all the Dominion work stuff like in, in DS9. That was, yeah, I mean, it's, it's I'm, I mean, maybe they're going to do some some two-parters i mean we'll we'll see but like um i'm excited for the um there's is there going there's going to be a lower decks crossover isn't there oh yeah i i I just finished scoring it yeah it's really good 
it's so, so good. Excited. Oh my god! I just, I mean, as a as a as a fan of of uh, of, of Lord X, <laughs> I yeah. think you know, it's it's just it, and it's great because it works for both stories. Like, mm -hmm. you know, did you collaborate with um with the Lord X team in terms of music? Uh, no, actually, no. But um, interesting. Yeah, uh, <laughs> because it is it is. The story is still, we, we are- it's still a Strange New World story. We are in Strange New Worlds. So this is yeah. viewed from the Strange New Worlds point of view, um, mm -hmm. as you will see. I, I don't want to spoil anything. No, no, I, we so, don't want you to spoil it. And also we don't want you to get in trouble with your with your overlords. <laughs> yeah. so my challenge, what, what but, um, my challenge was- mentioned... to, Oh, sorry. So I'm saying my, my challenge was was to feel like, you know, to have an anime, that animated feel from Lower Decks mm -hmm. into- that 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 Strange Worlds core. So as you will see, it's it's it is the Strange Worlds core, but in a very animated vibe. So I'm excited. I'm excited to hear it. Very different um, from anything else we did on the show. And you know, I love the I, we all love the fun romp kind of episodes, like uh, the Elysian Kingdom. Did, oh. uh, what was your? Did you did you enjoy like a more oh. uh, yeah. a more bombastic kind of epic vibe? You know, we're telling this like Princess Bride style yeah. almost story. <laughs> <laughs> sword fight sword fight um, yeah for sure it, it definitely you know episodes like that allow allow you to kind of expand your your play like you know your color plate like or, or like mm -hmm. your, um you know you can you can play with other toys and it's it's really fun so you yeah. know I, I i had some tremble or stuff in there like yeah. you know other other um timbers that that you know i can't include on a gorn episode uh and that's mm -hmm. kind of what i really love about like you know sci-fi because it it has all these like genres in in an you know in within the series right you have those rom-com episodes you have um you know dramas you have horror you, you you're kind of doing everything which is what you know what what i love doing like it i do a lot of movies i i, I do a lot of styles a lot of um different yeah. music i want to i definitely want to move into talking about um the thor love and thunder score and you know the the other the other features and, and other projects that you worked on besides star trek obviously we love talking about you know all of the different character moments that we can have with a show like strange new worlds um and also with prodigy um <laughs> uh, but uh so who is your favorite person to score for on strange new worlds and on prodigy i'm gonna make you pick oh, a favorite yeah. baby <laughs> character yeah, what characters are you are you the most fond? You mentioned you've mentioned Zero a couple times. Um, yeah, you mentioned, uh, Spock. So I was wondering who you're. Yeah, yeah. um, actually, I think on on Prodigy, it's probably Gwen. And oh, I love her. Maybe the whole Gwen and Dal situation there. Uh, you know their friendship. Um, to me, I don't know. I, I see. I see. I see Gwen as like my my favorite character on on the show. Mm -hmm. like, I feel like her character development is the biggest by far um and it's you know it's it's just like you know she's she's captivating also like just just the way like you, you know the actress also like all of it is is amazing and and to me like you know getting you know getting her not to feel like a bad character at the beginning because she is with the bad guys right like yeah. i mean her dad is evil <laughs> She's, she's on his team for a long time at the beginning yeah, yeah. um and and it, it ha there's this transition so musically it also provided this this great opportunity to to kind of start with somewhere and and go somewhere else with that same theme so to me i think it's gwen um and then on strange new worlds it's probably uhura because I, lo know, I love celia i think she's doing an incredible job and i and scoring um, you know, just all of the episodes that we've seen her having these great action moments, her relationship with Hemmer, yeah, uh, you know, uh, Hemmer. yeah, <laughs> but uh, you know, just these emotional moments that you know, and I think maybe that speaks to you. You know, she's in, she's a cadet. She's yeah, she's just <laughs> she's she's taken in by the wonder of it all, and I think that's a lot of us. That's how a lot of us would be when if we were on the bridge of that ship. And I love that. That's I love that you're our our you know you're representing that 
Right. Yeah, because I, I feel her, you know, I, you know, it's the same with with Prodigy, like, you know, they're, they're flying the ship for the first time, they have no mm -hmm. idea what they're doing. And it's kind of like me and my crew, you know, <laughs> when, when we first you know what you're doing, you're, you're, a, you're a cool lady. And you, 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 right. you earned your spot here. That's and I think true. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's true. I'm, imposter syndrome is a whole other conversation. Oh, I know. Well, I wanted, <laughs> we're going to talk a little bit about about women in film composing too. But let's, yeah. let um, yes. Yeah, so your favorite yeah. is uh, Gwyn and Uhura. I'm not oh, yeah. sure. Uh, and then um yeah so again uh, it's it's um yeah so uhura, we, we just get to explore her before you know before the uhura that we know from the original series and so to me that's really interesting because because personally on on children of the comet i feel like we have more knowledge of uhura than we knew in the entire original. yes yes and i was think i remember thinking that when we watched it and yeah. you know we hear about her tragic um the tragic yeah. accident that has befallen her family and um, you know, and the, her entry point into that story is the song she's humming. Yeah, exactly. And that song actually returns uh, <laughs> in a very alien variation that. Uh, <laughs> oh, uh, what were, I just, I'm just curious, what was the most unusual instrument you think you've used to score um, for Stranger Worlds or for just Uhura? Because I know there's uh, a lot of those African influences and probably, um, you know, we, we have a Western audience today, obviously, you know, that maybe we not, might not be familiar with, but that you've been using. Yeah, actually, I, I did not go into African instrument. I feel like it's it's kind of like, you know, to in on the nose, on the nose kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, to me, it's more more about the alto flute, um, because, you know, Aurora is is, you know, she's still young. She's kind of, you know, gentle and, and very like, you know, she's she's unsure where she wants to go. Um, and there's this like lower th that lower tone to me, and and it's a flute, so it's it's kind of mm -hmm. you know it's a very subtle instrument. It's a very um, like expressive instrument, but when you play it on on the low end of it, it's it has these like uncertainty to it, and and I, I love that stuff. And sometimes I use I use that for Pike as well, like you know, because it's such a you know that range for 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 like the wood, woodwind instruments like when you use the lower range it's it's so it's it's human it's it's just so emotional like it's yeah. it, it grabs you um and it's it's less expressive than let's say a cello a cello is very like um you know it takes you to a, a certain more point. melancholy it take yeah it takes you it 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 kind of forces the viewer to think something specific or it takes it to somewhere awesome. Specific. And I, I think that we all have our interpretation of what, you know, some of the characters are going through. So that kind of, to me, I'm like, yes, I'm marking where this is heading, but you can make your own, you know, thought of it. And we all know where it's ending, right? Like we know yeah. that she stays in Starfleet, but it's really, it makes it fun to watch her journey that way. Yes. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And, uh, you know, I feel the same again with, with those first seasons. I'm like, this is my first journey. This is, you know, I am. Yeah. Like, with my my crew that I can do anything without them so you know I'm, I'm extremely grateful for my orchestrators and and music editor and um score producer and mixers like and score prep like all all the people who yeah. really helped me out to get there and so it's like a whole team effort and and in a way we're like you know we're you're, on, you're your own crew I have number one and you're, you're on your your own crew in Starfleet <laughs> Yes, exactly. So, and, and apparently, also now part of the Marvel crew. Yes. <laughs> yes. Talk a little bit about Love and Thunder. I mean, okay, so Thor is my favorite Avenger. I'm sure that has something to do with how attractive Chris Hemsworth is. Oh my but God. <laughs> I, but I really love Norse mythology. I'm, I, you know, I have my master's in English literature. I love that background that it brings into the MCU, and of course, you know, being able to see Natalie Portman in that in that way and you know when they had that that first trailer where the, the music just comes in and she grabs the, the hammer and you can see like her <laughs> badass muscles I love that I love that so talk a little bit yeah. about you know how did you how did you get that gig you know what is right. what it was your you know what was your overall takeaway from that project? <laughs> uh well uh I I have to thank Michael uh Giacchino for that uh we've been working together for a few years and uh I'm lucky that he just uh texted me that if you know maybe I could jump up in and help on the project um he was directing uh uh War werewolf by by night um mm -hmm. and, you know, there, there was like uh yeah he he originally started thor on his own 
Um, and then like there was some COVID stuff and and like a lot of delays with the actual movie and they did some reshoots and stuff. Uh, so by that point, Michael had written about half of the score, but the movie has changed a lot. So, you know, <laughs> I was like, I'm super happy to jump in and help. And he was, you know, he was just super busy directing, you know, another movie for Marvel, which is a huge dream of his. And I'm, I'm very yeah. happy. You know, if you haven't seen it, it's it's great. You should all go see it now. It's, and it has a great score too. Um, but uh, so, so yeah, so I, you know, just jumped in. I listened to all, all of his, you know, his, the, the work that he already did, the themes. Um, and I just jumped into it, you know, and it, it was just like an incredible, you know, the store, the store, the actor, I mean, I'm a huge Chris Hemsworth fan as well. Uh, and also just, you know, Russell Crowe, like all these people, I'm like, are they on my screen? Is this real? Like, I, you know, I just, <laughs> what am I scoring for these people? I can't, yeah. you know, <laughs> they're just like, you know, all, all the dream, you know, Chris Pratt, even that he's a very short time in the movie. I'm like, mm -hmm. uh, no, sorry, not Chris Pratt. Uh, what's, what's his name? Yeah, it's Chris Pratt. Sorry. No, I'm a bit confused. For uh, Star-Lord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's Chris Pratt. There's yeah. so many Chris's. It's okay. You're, you're, I, I, you get a pass. Yeah. Plus then also, uh, we had um, uh, Christian Bale also. So variation right. on the Chris. Oh, my God. <laughs> Bale. oh wow. Um, so, and Tessa Thompson. So, um, so yeah. yeah. I love her. Oh, I love, I love that. You really want to do a great job because you're, you know, you're basically coming in to – you know, <laughs> to save the day in a way. And, and it's, it's a, it's a lot of like, you know, you have to rise to the challenge because it is a challenge. It's a lot of writing to do in a very short amount of time. Um, you work with the best, you, the best musicians in the world, you know, it was a, a hundred piece orchestra and a big choir, like all, all these amazing, you know, musicians that you want to be worthy of their talent. <laughs> and don't worry, I, Nami, don't worry. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I agree. hundred percent. I am, but, but it's also, you know, under stress. Yeah. Of, yeah. Really I would be stressed if I booked a Marvel and had never done one. I'd be like, oh. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, uh, thankfully it all worked out really well. And, you know, we, we had like, it was really fun also to write a score without woodwinds. Cause to me, that is new. That was very new. Um, so the orchestra didn't have any any woodwinds. It was like uh, strings, brass, two harp, um, two harps, um, and then guitars, uh, um, a drum kit, like you know, drum set, mm -hmm. um, and bass, and uh, and some synth, synth stuff, uh, but no woodwinds. So <laughs> no woodwinds. That, that was a challenge for the flute the flute player. Yeah, it was. It was. <laughs> and if anybody has any questions about um if anyone has any questions for Nami about Thor, uh, please drop them in the chat and we will be our our intrepid uh, comms and creative director Wade will feed them to us. Uh, but uh, I, I wanted to just mention that. But yeah, um I think we had talked a little bit about uh scoring and bringing in more women into the Marvel universe, you know, bringing in, you know, yeah. we've got that the, the there are a few greater now. role for Jane, greater role for um uh, Tessa Thompson, you know, you're, you're seeing, we're seeing more and more of, of that in the MCU, which is fantastic. And we should see more, uh, more female uh, composers as well. <laughs> and, we're, we are and I'm so glad you said that because we're going to talk about that too. Um, so yeah, this is a very male dominated area that we're in and, you know, not just Star Trek and sci-fi and, and comics, but, uh, you know, film composing is, uh, I, I have been a film music fan for a long time. Um, a, a great friend of mine in college was very into it and, but I am entirely familiar with so many men in, in, the, in this industry. And I really could only name Shirley Walker up until recently who did Batman. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the, you know, the women that you have found to be great mentors. And also um, Nami is part of the uh, Women in Film Music um, Alliance. Am I getting that right? Uh, exactly. Clients for women film composers, but I am for women film composers. I have it written down. I'm just, I'm just uh, <laughs> riffing on my notes here. But um, I'm, I'm really glad that that organization exists and that you can, you know, lift each other up. So I, I would love for you to talk a little bit about that, and you know, right. even just going off of your experience in the male-dominated MCU, right? And and into and you know, and you said Michael G. Kino is someone who's mentoring you, and that's fantastic too, and that's important. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so, yeah, I mean, growing up, I, I did not encounter a lot of female composers. I encountered Rachel Portman, who won the Oscar for Chocolate at the time, I think, or was mm -hmm. it the House of Cider, the House of Cider Rules? But I, so I listened to her scores a lot, and I listened to Anne Dadley's score, both British, wonderful British composers. Um, 
but I didn't have any female mentors, even when I went to the Jerusalem Academy of Music or, or the scoring program here at USC, there were no female teachers. And I'm glad to say that that has changed. I know that right. in the, the recent few years, they are having uh, some some female mentors there and, and uh, female professors. So that's really, really good. And um, yeah, the Alliance uh, started like around, I think it was 2012 or 13. So this was a pretty recent thing. And I joined uh, very early on. Um, and, and, and this group is, is you know, a community of, of, uh, of women film and TV composers. Um, and we are indeed trying to <laughs> lift each other up. And there's like all these programs, um, you know, now, now I'm on the board and, and we, we're doing these like, uh, like a mentorship program. So, so uh, that way, you know, we connect between like established uh, composers who are working in the business for years and years and years. Um, and they want to help out. Like a lot of them want to, you know, I'm talking about ma male composers. They, they want to help out. They just sometimes really? don't know how. So this is a good way to be an ally and, and sort of, um, you know, to take a, a young mentee and, and, and help her out and like, you know, invite her to sessions. See, cause there's so many rules that are not written in our industry. There's so many scenarios that you encounter as a young composer that you don't really know how to deal with. Like, you know, how to do these, these deals, how to keep your rights, how to, how to handle a difficult filmmaker. And, you know, all these unwritten, these are unwritten things. You don't learn them at school. I mean, I went to school. I didn't learn that. At school. Well, this is, that's, that's a lot of professions. You know, you can, you can go to law school, you can get your, you can go to school yeah. for teaching, but practical experience is where you're going to find your. But also how do you, how do you sell yourself? How do you do a pitch meeting yeah. work? How do you become so confident? And yes, confidence comes, it's a circle. Like the more you do, the more confident you're going to get um, to, to become. But, but it really helps when there's a mentor that, that, kind of answers your questions and and can guide you and can you know and, and i'm not even talking about hiring you but you know if if anything comes to that you know obviously that makes our organization very happy if you know if if we can actually help someone get get a job in the industry and get the experience um but the idea is is to sort of you know get get us get us out there and celebrate the achievements or of of women film composers as well like there's so many achievements that are are you know as as you're saying i'm i'm humble yes i am but i i know my worth but you know it it, it definitely helps when you know as a community we are celebrating each other and and we're you know going to be a little maybe we should be a little less humble about about our achievements so you see you know Nellie Holt scoring Loki and, and Amy Dorothy scoring um, She-Hulk and, and Laura Kerman scoring Miss Marvel. Like all these things are happening and, and these names should be out there and celebrated. So, you know, uh, to me, uh, that's that's the purpose of, of our organization. And, and we're just, you know, we're hope we're going for equal opportunity. I'm not saying like, yeah. oh, we're better, you know. We just we need that equal opportunity to fix something that has been going on for a hundred years, uh, you know. Where for sure, for sure, movies are scored by a uh, by women, so you know that that means like, <laughs> you know, it's not entirely equal. So, <laughs> well, we we had a we had a note from a, a someone in the audience. Um, Lori said that you're a groundbreaker in your industry, and of course, in the Star Trek franchise. Um, and so what women in, in the franchise, it doesn't have to just be Star Trek, but you can, you know, any, anywhere you've worked, um, who, who is giving you that inspiration? You mentioned a couple of women uh, that are, are doing great, great work for Marvel, but you know, who specifically have you looked at and been like, yes, that is, that is who I want to emulate. That's who, whose career I want to be. Um, well, surprisingly, it, that, that's the thing. It's not, it's not the women. <laughs> like I, I would, and I think that's a valuable, interesting answer. Yeah, it, it is because, you know, as as I'm saying, growing up, I I didn't even think about like you know uh, that gap. It it was it, you know when I when I only you know started diving into film scores, and then I'm like, wait, this is uh, you know all these great composers that I love: James and Howard, Michael Giacchino, Tom Newman, <laughs> like Alexander Desplat, yeah. and well, it goes on and on and on and on. I'm like, yeah, and Rachel Portman, and I'm Dudley, and. And then I'm like, who else? So, you oh, know, I know Mod. Well, well, yeah. Now it's kind of getting there. You know, with Heldor is doing amazing stuff. So yeah, there's like there's like a lot of really really uh, talented women out there now. But like when I started out, you know, I was looking at composers like Tom Newman, who who later was my mentor, and I I you know I love him like. He's he's incredible, um, and it definitely helped helped me a lot, um, and. 
but yeah, so so my my inspiration was yes, I want to do I want to do things like Tom does them, you know, and I, I want to have that balance too with like life and career and like all these, you know, and I want to want be- all of, we want to have all of that, you know. We- exactly. Um, so yeah, and and I know that a lot of maybe a lot of f- female composers are are kind of sh- shying away from from these things because you know because there's also that like you know career life balance that like you know some you know. Uh, it, it's hard. It can be hard. No, I know. And I, I feel like, you know, men are still not asked that question of like, you know, how are, how are you balancing your children and your, and your film yeah. score? <laughs> so, 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 yeah. But, uh, but uh, I also think um, just overall, you know, you're, you're, you, you know, I think we're still kind of the only women in the room sometimes, you know, even in yeah. uh, organization yeah. and in the space industry, you know, yeah. we've, we've been part explore Mars is partnered with, so many cool women for our Humans to Mars Summit, and we are striving for equality in gender representation um, and diversity as well. And I think we're there, we're seeing so many more women that are, are rising in the ranks, um, you know, CEOs of incredible corporations that are doing great work. Um, and, and, you know, what, but I think that a lot of the the women that are, are in our organization and in the space industry in film composing, you know, we are used to being some of the only women in the meeting. Yeah, I mean, it happens. It happens to me a lot. Like even on Star Trek, on on Strange and Worlds, like often, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I'll I'll go to a dub mix and it, it will be me and uh, like one of the assistants, uh, and then everyone else is guys, <laughs> you know, writers, editors, direct, direct, you know, uh, sound team, like all. all so so I I think it's a, a general problem in in our industry, as as mm-hmm. a whole. Um, and so, yeah, we we definitely need to remedy that. Like, and it takes time, and it takes, you know, I, I understand these, but but yeah, the, the right way to do it, in my opinion, is is to kind of like find those allies who are going to, yeah. you know, to want to support others, and and to like, you know, a composer that has like ten TV shows, you know, maybe he, he can co-write something with, you know, a, a you know a female composer and help her, you know, get the credit yeah. she needs that, so that the executives would be like, oh, okay, you know she can do that. That's great. You know, and if he trusts her, then we can definitely also trust her. So, you know, she very can- important to have allies in this space, yeah. um, you know, so, for, for women and non-binary um, people and, and making sure that those voices are, like I said, you know, like you said, you know, with the, the Alliance and, and everything that you guys are doing yeah. to, to bring attention to that. Is there, is there a way that um like, if, if you have your fans want to see more of you, is there a way that, or, or not just you, but also other ladies in film, you know, way to build yeah. them up, you know, besides maybe just follows on social media? Um, well, watch your movies, <laughs> <laughs> comment on them, and and like, yes, uh, you know, listen, listen on Spotify, like, li- you know, go to concerts, go to like, you know, th- there's there's way to, sh- I mean, yeah, social media is a big part of it, uh, of course, but even just, you know, when I get. Emails from fans. It's really nice. Like it's it's you know it's yeah, it's reach out, boost that confidence. Sweet, you know, and you know, I'm not really seeking any validation from from you know outside my you know I'm I'm very comfortable with with who I am and with the music I write. I know it's great. I know that's why I keep getting hired. Like I know I'm really good, but but it it obviously it it is helpful because then you feel like you're you're doing some cuz you know I'm writing it for them I want I want everyone to enjoy the track as much as I enjoy it um and and so to me it's it's really good to know that you know that you know people like it and I, I'm sure that it's the same for you know Natalie Holt who did Obi-Wan you know that's a huge yeah. show great score and you know it it is important it 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 it, it does um it does help with confidence. Um, yes. Yeah. So that kind of stuff. And then, yeah, I mean, if you, if you're friends with the, uh, with Hollywood executives, <laughs> yeah. then, uh, <laughs> bring, bring, bring that into the, make some intros, share the love. <laughs> you know, things have happened from Twitter. Like it's, you know, yes. people- and you know, it's funny just with the, the whole, <laughs> the whole Twitter situation, people have talked so much about it being a place of connection for professionals, especially yeah professionals who would maybe not necessarily have gotten their uh, their work seen and their work you know promoted 
Yeah. So so. I think that that's, that's really good. And, you know, we're, we're all going to follow Nami. on. She's at Nami Composer on everything, by the way. <laughs> and um, But uh, I wanted just to, you know, we had a couple of great questions. We also have some giveaway from Star Trek oh, Unlimited. Wow. We've got three right, robes. Right. Yeah. We've already had some great questions that I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be giving a robe to one, at least one of the questions that we've, uh, we've gotten. Yeah. But if you guys have any more questions, please drop them in the chat and Wade will give them to us. Um, we had one question that I have uh, up here scrolling um, saying uh, we have a general admiration for you, Nami, and saying how great it is to learn more about you an incredible composer and person to work with Thank from uh, Brian, Brian Viverts. Oh, Brian. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Brian is actually one of our, mic our, our sound engineers and mixers on, uh, sorry, score engineers and mixers on Strange New Worlds. Um, well, hi, Brian. Thanks yeah. for tuning in. Yes, yes, yes. So you're you're gonna. I mean, you've already heard his work, and he's mm -hmm. amazing. Um, and there's more and, too. Yep. Oh, great. I'm excited to hear more from from him. And uh, also, someone had mentioned. Um, you know, we we have the the theme songs versus um, uh, your day. You know, day to day scoring on the. Did, so, did you have any themes that you wrote maybe overall that you're you're constantly bringing in that seems like a theme that you wrote in addition to you know maybe calling into the yeah, the, Jeff so Russo, the Jeff Russo theme or the um, the Michael Giacchino theme for Prodigy. Right. Um, on, on Strange Worlds, I, I almost don't do that. But on, on Prodigy, um, it's it's very apparent, like, you know, we, we it was a, you know, it was a conversation the very early on, like, how are we going to use that thing? Because it's just like, um, it captures the essence of, of the crew so well. Um, so we decided that whenever there's like a major success for for the crew, whenever there's a big moment that like, it's just like, you know, they come together because this is what it is about. Like, you know, you, you get a, a bunch of kids, uh, you know, aliens who don't know each other, who don't even speak the same language. They can't communicate when when we start. That is true. Yeah, I remember that. that. Brings them together, you know, um, that that, you know, they have to collaborate. They have to become a crew. So slowly as they become a crew, that theme becomes more prominent. Um so that's that was how I, you know we would incorporate that one and then as i said like you know i you know whenever we have a new character that's going to be a big character uh then you know i install these these you know i wrote i write the motif early on and then i start installing these like snippets of that motif and then you know if you rewatch it you'll recognize things that you haven't you know seen before so um so it's really cool for me to, to do that even even when it, with essentia and with the you know with oh the, yeah her secret her secret yeah. identity <laughs> into you know and the diviner like you know even from the from very early on like you, you know you then realize that the diviner and the vana theme are, are connected so um you know it's it's very it's very helpful when you know how the story where the story is going so i i would actually read all the scripts beforehand for for prodigy mm -hmm. it was yeah you know, again because we have the time for that it's animation yeah. so we start super early uh, as opposed to Stranger Worlds, where I, you know, I get the scripts, I, I it, but it's very, you know, it's it's a little late, <laughs> um, and it changes it changes a lot between that and and the actual um, uh, footage that comes out. So you know, I don't often do that with Stranger Worlds sometimes, um, but yeah. So so anyway, I you know, I'm a traditional composer in that sense. Like working with themes is is and and a, a better way to do it in, in my. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question from uh, Richard Thomas Jordan. He said, have you ever watched films from earlier decades, like 40s and 50s, to gather inspiration? Um, from 40s and 50s? Um, I have a little bit, like the apartment, like, you know, Hitchcock stuff. Or, or mm -hmm. I'm not sure if it's 40s, though, or 50s. Uh, I, previous decades that are not 80s. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I mean, to me, the the '90s is like my my decade of of, of film, uh, Shawshank Redemption and uh, Forrest Gump, like these kind of movies. Um, to me, are are you know, uh, Back to the Future. I think that's even earlier. Um, so yeah. you know, I I love you know uh, Jaws and ET, like. Uh, and it's mainly score based, like a lot of the things that I, I know. And I, I, so I, see, I see John Williams every summer at the um, the yeah. film night at Tanglewood in Western Massachusetts. I've gone every year, except for these last couple COVID years, obviously. Um, yeah. And and seeing that he he usually does ET as an encore, so you'll see like the the <laughs> ET like like come over the the top of the orchestra, like they they yeah. project it on the wall, and he'll he'll 
they'll have that playing. Um, and now we have a couple other questions. We have one about we have we have a bunch that have just come in. Um, Lori asked if you're gonna if you would collaborate with a lyricist, who would you want to work with? Oh wow, this is a really good question. I I don't know. Um, I think wow. Lori's getting a robe. She's asked several good <laughs> questions. It's what? I think Lori is going to get a Star Trek robe. She's asked a lot of questions. I think we'll have to pick her. Wow. Honestly, I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, it's probably someone from Broadway. I mean, I, I love yeah. I love Wicked. Um, was oh, that Wicked is my favorite. And, uh, and uh, Winnie, uh, oh, I forgot her last name. Uh, probably the writers of, of Wicked. Yeah, I, I do. I love I love that musical and I love the I love the the way that they incorporate, they even incorporate like, so we had a question from Annika who said, my pet passion is choreographing to film scores. Can you envision your work as a dance? So Wicked, I think has that physicality to it. I remember, you know, she's, when they sing um, in the, the beginning of the second act and she does that like Aida kind of like, or not Aida, um, uh, uh, Avita, Avita. <laughs> she does the like Avita moment and they, they'll have these little callbacks to these classical musicals that are mostly choreographed. Yeah. Um, so that's a great. So yeah. What do you, what is your what are your thoughts on choreographing and dance oh. to, your, to your music? Um, amazing. I mean, I've done that in 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 school. Actually, we had a class with with choreographs, <laughs> and you know, they would I would write something, and the, the the choreograph would would create a dance, and then I'll shift my music based on her dance. So that was, you know, we did that a few times, and it was it was such a great experience because because you it opens up your mind to like definitely d different ideas like I, the, the things I wrote for that are so different from start from anything I do here and and it's it's really it, it really opens up your mind and it gives you op opportunity to go to you know to boldly go <laughs> really yeah. uh, there are other you know realms of, of, of um Chris our CEO Chris mentioned so our CEO Chris interviewed Nami for a book that he's doing called Scoring Space. And he mentioned that Michael Giacchino's Jupiter Ascending score was made into a ballet. Right. Well, that was a Pacific Northwest Ballet. So if we could do a, a, a Nami Melamad ballet I mean, yeah, uh, well, mashup, I'm, that would I'm, be amazing. I'm writing, I'm writing two pieces right now, but for or, for orchestras, like one of them is in Israel, one of them is here. Um, so, you know, in the future, I definitely want to do something, you know, a more, you know, not, not just film scores, but for, for the moment, mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm enjoying this. I, I love telling a story. I love I love that all the arts come together, um, you know, and, and that is, you know, it's, it's like the acting, the directing, the writing, the cinematography, the sound, the music, like everything comes, all these arts come together um, to tell a certain story. And, and to me, that's like, you know, I love that my music is part of something bigger um, and it takes you through a journey. So, yeah, I, I love those collaborations. So, yeah, a, a ballet, an opera one day for sure. A musical. Not for that. I, I would love a musical. Would be, a musical Star Trek. People want the musical Star Trek episode because, you know, we have such vocal powerhouses in Discovery like Anthony Rapp. I know Mary oh, yeah. Wiseman went to Juilliard. Yeah. Funny. Um, I saw him on Rent like years ago and then I'm like, you do. Is that the same guy? <laughs> <laughs> when they booked him for Star Trek, I was over the moon. I was like, this is the best. Can we get Adina Menzel next? Yeah. Oh my God. You know what? That would be amazing. Can you she imagine casting her as like maybe like, you know, just a cool alien with like just a little bit yeah. of like <laughs> Oh, she could be a Romulan. Or she, she could have been be a great Romulan. Romulan. Exactly. Um, but yeah. <laughs> so um oh and uh Rosalind Bly says she sees your guitars back there and she wanted to know do you play guitar as well as oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I play guitar. Sorry, I didn't introduce that. Um, I started when I started out. I was playing piano. Uh, my my older sister plays played piano at the time, um, and I you know I wanted to do everything that she does. I still want to do everything. That she does. How many years? How many years apart are you guys? Three. She's old. She's three years old. I'm I am three years older than my brother, so I understand oh, that. So you understand that gap, yeah. Um, so so you always you know you look up to them, um, mm -hmm. and I you know so I started playing piano, and then they had a school orchestra my school and I played oboe um but oh. I didn't break, break the reads all the that's time. a double read I mean I know that because my brother played he was um he was the like first chair for the all catholic orchestra so I oh. remember the I remember the um <laughs> the very precise uh needs to to make the reads and like where to buy them and you know how to take care of them that was a big 
Right. So, you know, so what is your, um, what is your, uh, so have you, when you play oboe, like what, where do you bring that instrument in? I think that's a very interesting instrument. Oh, sure. so, um, and, yes. I don't play oboe anymore because I would break the reeds all the time. And, <laughs> and ultimately, you know, I moved to an instrument that doesn't break, which is a fluid. Um, but I still love, I love the oboe and, and, and I, you know, I, I will often bring it in. There, there's an interesting thing where, where you're working on a budget and you have less trumpets. If you add a, the oboe in between the trumpets that you do have, it will kind of take the timber of that. So that's a, a nice trick for orchestration. Um, but also uh, oboe is just like, you know, a beautiful lyrical instrument. And yeah, we, we bring that sometimes in, in Strange New Worlds for, for pike things. Uh, mm -hmm. Like you know, when you're really trying to get like a very lyrical emotion, because it's a very stand, it's a standout instrument. Like it, you know, it, you it's can, got a very, it's, it's got a very specific. You know, you hear it. So, you know, want to be careful with that but but a lot of times um we'll have like english horn too like uh for for a lot of the voice and stuff um because it's such a again it's a, it's a really cool timber that you don't often hear in the orchestra setting definitely not in star trek um not before so um so yeah i'm you know i'm i'm a big fan of it i i want to get back to it one day um and so yeah i think i was probably 14 when I picked up the guitar <laughs> and uh, I started, you know, learning chords and stuff and just playing, you know, some Israeli songs. And I wrote some songs like that. That's was kind of like my, my big, the, the first time I started understanding chords with, with guitar, then I translated the piano. I was like, Oh, I can, you know, so it was kind of part of, it was part of, you know, my musical journey to understand harmony. Um, so yeah, I, I still play them. They're, you know, they're, they're fine. Right they're hanging out. Um, so uh, Roslyn also asked, do you have any specific influences from Israeli music? Um, I, I have to say I, I do, but I, I'm not sure how to measure that because, you know, when you grow up in a certain place, you listen to the radio, there's a lot of, of songs. There's a lot of Jewish music. There's a lot of, you know, there's certain chord progressions, there's certain harmonies, there's certain mm -hmm. melodical, um, styles that, that kind of, in you know, they're implemented in you because you've listened to it for so long. So I think subconsciously, yes, it's it's definitely there. And and you also having played in ensembles, both in flute and and piano, um, then you know when you play that music, it really get goes in into your veins. So even if you're not thinking about it, then it's out. You've there. already absorbed it. Yeah, and then with American Pickle, obviously, you know, I could channel all these these Jewish music <laughs> energy uh, to that score because it, it talks about mm -hmm. a Jewish immigrant, um, you know, and and uh, so it's American Pickle is the name of the. Is it a short or a film? And American Pickle is a film by by Seth Rogen. He plays a double part. Um, oh, the, yes, yes, yes. I do remember seeing that. I saw it on your. I saw it on your. Um, your, your IMDb page. That's really, yeah. that's really cool. So it's, it's, it's a very, it's just, it's a very Jewish film. Like it, it talks mm -hmm. about Jewish identity, um, about generational gap, like, um, and you know, ab about kind of being a fish out of the water. Cause Herschel, uh, the, the main character is from 1920 and he, <laughs> in, in time, he, he's like the captain America of pickles. He, he moves <laughs> years in time uh to 2020 to 2020 so um you know there's also that that jump um of like That's what cool. culture looked like then and what it looks like now so you know to me this is like a great uh, you know space to, to express my my own identity so that was really nice and yeah definitely i i channeled all the you know like yeah, like a lot of Hebrew songs, energy, but like the older stuff, not not the stuff that you have on the radio right now, which is way yeah. more American uh, influence. Let's say <laughs> like it's very yeah. you know <laughs> rap pop. Yeah. Awesome. Um, I also uh, I had noted that you have won a couple awards. Uh, you won for Passage, which was a short movie that you did. Yeah, um, wow. that was the Hollywood Music and Media Awards that was in 2018, and then you won for a video game you did, Medal of Honor. A video game scoring yeah. is very interesting as well. That's the International Film Music Critics Association Award. Ooh, yeah, yeah, that was really cool. Yeah, that was another project I did with Michael, uh, where he wrote the mm -hmm. main, and then I 
based the score on on that. Um, it was very different to write for for a video game because you know it's not at the time is is not linear. Like it's not you know on on a movie or a show. Um, you know you just go with the character all the time is, is what I do. Um, and you you get you know your music is derived from their experiences on the timeline. But a video game is interactive, so the 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 player makes those decisions so you kind of have to create like a general picture general mood general intensity levels let's say uh that you know what what the level is going to look like in the game and then you have to like create all these stingers and like you know when when uh the player is doing something that triggers that kind of music that comes in so it's like it's less anticipated but it's also giving you a bigger, um, you know, it, it leaves more room for imagination because I'm like, okay, I, ha I have to imagine what, what's going to happen now. And when I work on it, I see like a, a non-finished animation. Sometimes, you know, I don't really know the story. It's like a, just a, you know, a general view of, of, the, of the level. Um, but it, so that's the challenge is like, you have to, you have to figure out what it's going to sound like, how it's, how it's going to feel. And there's less, less direction from the picture and more direction from your imagination, which is really cool, but also kind of like di very different from what I did before. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was, it's fun. It's, you know, ob obviously it's great to be recognized for what you do. And we just got nominated for, for the Thor uh, score and in the same uh, thing. So. Oh, wonderful. Congratulations. Yeah. Well, yeah, incredible. Incredible. So his score, you know, for Dr. Strange was amazing. So, you know, I'm perfectly good with, you know, with the no, <laughs> I'm so excited for your nomination. That's oh, fantastic. Like, you know, if um, you're bit, if you're bitten, have have yourself bitten by Danny Elfman. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. If you're yeah, no, it's it's uh, there's it's so honor. much. It's good. An honor. <laughs> um, there's there's uh, we have about five minutes left, but there's there's there's, there's so many good um, yeah. scores that are out there right now, and people that are creating in your space and. Um, you know, thank you so much for staying for an extra 15 minutes because I know we've had a lot of questions. Um, I think that we have three winners for our robes who have asked great questions today. Roslyn Bly, who asked some great questions. Kira um, as well. Congratulations. And Lori, thank you for your participation in those great questions that I know Nami was very excited to take. Um, but before we wrap up, you know, do you want to talk a little bit about maybe what you're watching now, something exciting oh. um, that you're, I think we had, when we were chatting, you mentioned the new Kate Blanchett film about a composer. Oh my God. I love that movie. I watched, okay. Uh, this is, I have not gone to the Called movie theater twice. Tar. Harry is, that, is, say it, tar, is it Tar? There's an accent over the A. Yeah. Tar uh, made me go twice to the theater because it's so good. Um, and it, you know, I might go a third time. It's just so smart. And just, just from a filmmaker perspective, but also from, from a story perspective, like I think, you know, and as a musician, uh, okay, sorry, I'll explain. This movie is about a conductor. Um, uh, and you know, she's like, it's, it's kind of like a biopic, but it's not, it's not based on a true story or anything like that. Like there's no, there's yeah, no it's a, a faux biopic. There is no person in the world that's called Tar. The, the, yeah, the no, no one, there's no, and, and there is no, sadly also there's no female um, conductor or director or, or you know, or, or um, orchestra director in that level yet. So, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that maybe, but, um, you know, I'm not sure that, that this movie is the right example for no. <laughs> I, I read I read the synopsis. It's a little uh yeah, it's a little intense. She's a little crazy. It's it really goes portrait. downhill. But but the way that they did it, it's just such really smart writing and really smart like um they really captured the orchestra world and they really like they did their homework with with the dialogue and every line and every Every move, of, every edit of this movie is very calculated, and there's almost no score in it. But you know, and I'm, I'm I usually love scores, but but it's just so yeah. I highly recommend it. Um, wow, and anything, any uh, TV that you're watching that we or like you know. Well, I'm what, catching up with Better Call Saul. Uh, this is Better Call Saul. Oh, yeah, I, that's very, a great show. I'm very delayed, um, and I just uh, I just finished wa watching um, wor Working Moms. Oh, which yeah? is a Canadian show. Yeah, <laughs> my sister watches it, and of course, I do everything. Of course. So um, that's you know, it's on Netflix. It's a, it's a really good show. Uh, it's a comedy. I like comedy. You know, I am I'm, I'm actually a comedy. You know, when I watch, I, I I'll choose Grace and Frankie and Schitt's Creek. And, oh, I love yeah, Grace and Frankie. Um, mm. Those kind of uh, Dairy Girls. Dairy Girls. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. So 
um you know I'll, i'd go for I that i love that we're having we're mentioning all these shows and, and there's so many women involved yeah, you know, I, mean, I like dairy girls all that we we watch a lot of women uh women driven <laughs> drama here as well yeah. Gilbert, <laughs> i watched Gilbert now season three's out so uh oh, my yep, yep. Spring it actually this is a good um yeah heather heather mcintosh um uh amazing amazing composer i you know and she's a mentor for uh, for our program. And Ali Newman, also a, a wonderful Australian composer. Uh, she's here also amazing uh, on the on the, the board of, of the Alliance. So, you know, it's again, like, I can see a change happening within the, the TV industry. Um, that's, you know, we're getting there. It's, it's starting. That's fantastic. That's, well, that's thank great. you so much for being here and for sharing your experiences. I know I've, I have found it so incredibly re rewarding to talk to you about this and about your trajectory. And thank you to everybody who's been watching and took time out of your day to ask Nami some phenomenal questions. Um, and also, uh, we would love to see people at our summit in May at uh, Humans to Mars, which is in DC, a uh, beautiful venue at the National Academy of Sciences building. Um, and also, we're going to have Gates McFadden there and maybe some other surprise guests. So Gates is going to be moderating a panel on uh, with uh, incredible women in the space who are literally the real life Dr. Crusher. Like Aww. these women are are, are are leaders in bioaeronautics and just some incredible work that they're doing in order to bring everything forward. Um, so please join us, uh, H2M. You, there's, we'll have some discount codes out with our Star Trek friend community soon. Um, if you listen to any of the podcasts on the Trek Geeks Network or um, Women at Warp or Delta Flyers, you know, please uh, take a listen and we're going to have some, uh, some, some discount codes for registration soon. But um, thank you, Nami. This has been fantastic. And I can't wait to see more from you. And we're going to make sure we all follow you on social media. <laughs> non composer and then also follow explore mars and keep an eye out for more fun programming like this so thank you everybody and have a great rest of your week and nami thank you again this has been brilliant yes live long and prosper everybody long and prosper, everyone <laughs> bye